Item Number SCP-6697 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-6697-1 is to be kept in a standard containment locker at Site-59. Following the June 19, 2021 ruling of the Ethics Committee, a moratorium has been placed on further viewing of SCP-6697-1. If additional instances of SCP-6697 are recovered, there will be a maximum of five viewings beyond the non-anomalous series finale of each new instance for archival recording purposes. Research is ongoing to determine the best course of action to improve the welfare of its inhabitant. As such, non-anomalous recordings of individual episodes are available upon request. Proposals for improvement may be submitted to Director Nysmith. SCP-6697 is the collective designation for the quote, Show Must Galwan unquote, series of video cassettes created by the Totlaysoft Corporation. Only one instance, SCP-6697-1, has been identified and contained, but promotional material from the SCP-2803 compound indicates that this cassette is a part of a larger series. SCP-6697-1, titled Cinefold, Sessions 1 through Infinity, is 23 minutes long. The first minute is a brief promotional segment from Totlysoft, including a frequently misspelled title card for the episode. The remainder of the video is an episode of Seinfeld. The episode in question changes with every complete viewing of the cassette, extending past the series finale and into a hypothetical and presumably infinite season 10. The maximum amount of new episodes is not known. The following is a summary from the tape's cover. Ah, Cinefold, the magnificent shoe about new things, entrancing Americans all throughout the USA. But when we come to end of Session 9, we ask, when Session 10? Foo! Where is Session 10? It cannot be over, oh grief. Wait no longer, Sanifold consumer. Like the Zangortlings of Buddhist marks, tightly soft is extend have never-ending video technologies of heart-wrenching Domog Ovi into the ha-ha realm of comedy. Every episode is something new. See Jerry, Inlay, Gorg, and Grammar go on further adventures. Occasionally saying ya da in other stupid words, forever. Dick Lamers. Due to many locked complaints about most noble and botable Totley Soft mastery of English Largridge, you jerks, Totley Soft is being receptive of criticism and such and haven't used powerfully Totley Soft because computer algorithm to alla characters of Cindy Ford to write dumb solves. Log of SCP-6697-1 Episodes Truncated Episode Number Title Summary 10-1 Recon Trashkin Upon their release from prison after the series finale, the cast attempt to rebuild their lives from the ground up, but they're short on cash. Newman wins $50 million in the lottery. Seeing his chance, Jerry attempts to bury the hatchet between them. This predictably fails. 10-3 Mon Mon After getting drunk in Vegas, Elaine wakes up to find out she had been married to an eccentric hippie known only as Moon Man. Elaine is unable to divorce Moon Man due to an unspecified redeeming quality that Elaine can only describe by slightly moving her palm back and forth and making a guttural whining noise. Moon Man is portrayed by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and he becomes a recurring character until his death in Episode 10-174. 10-5 Grammar Dog Ovi Kramer inadvertently comes into possession of a large saltwater crocodile, which he proceeds to name Russell and tries to pass off as a dog. The self-writing narrative process repeats as normal until episode 10-7, Jerry's New Business, 
in which George Costanza begins to deviate from the narrative on his own. The exact point at which this deviation occurs is a scene in Monk's Cafe, toward the midpoint in 10-7. Jerry. And then I told myself, why not? And look at me now, an entrepreneur. That is how you say it, by the way. I checked. George says nothing. He sits and stares at his coffee pensively. You know, you can tell me if you're jealous. No one's going to come in and arrest you for it. George suddenly stands up. He places a $5 bill next to his coffee cup. George. Tell him to keep the change. What the? Jerry, I can't do this anymore. Goodbye. George leaves. Jerry briefly displays confusion but then carries on his conversation with the place where George once sat. I mean, some people just hate the free market. Approximately seven seconds of silence. Whoa, slow your roll there, Stalin. The episode continues as normal, save for the absence of George. None of the characters, save for Jerry, notice his absence. They continue to act as if he is there. For example, at one point, Kramer passes George a cup of coffee and it shatters on the ground. Kramer later pantomimes drinking said coffee. Episode Number Title Summary 10-8 Bible Stody Kramer and Newman try to become born-again Christians. George appears in another monk's coffee scene with the other three main characters. He's agitated and confused, demanding to know how he got there in the first place. George's comments are ignored completely. He is absent from all subsequent scenes. 10-9 Il Mon Mon Moon Man inadvertently lands a leading role in Bertie's Il Trovatore at the Met. George appears only briefly in a scene in Jerry's apartment. The scene consists of George looking around, yelling, The fuck! I just want to leave! and running away. 10-10 Prince Charming the original plot of this episode is unclear. The closest estimation is that Jerry and George try a new dating strategy in which they claim to be a part of the extended royal family of Liechtenstein. The original plot of episode 10-10 is significantly altered by the opening scene of Monk's Cafe. As George sits at the booth, he holds his hands in the air as if holding a steering wheel. Jerry, so let's go over the plan again. I'll say that I'm… George, I was driving. Duke Reifhauser. I don't know, too Nazi? George, interrupting the laugh track. Jerry, I was driving, just now. Why am I here? So, are we going to go over the… No, no we are not. I was on I-87 a few seconds ago. Audra was in the passenger seat. We were… God damn it, where's Audra? Okay, uh… This is where you tell me who Audra is. My fiance. You're getting married? Yes. And you didn't tell me? Yeah, I didn't, because I want nothing to do with you anymore. Jerry looks at him with exaggerated doubt. Take me back. Now. Okay, there's no way I can really herald Pinter the subtext out of this, so… Is this you telling me how bad the plan is by avoiding it, or… Shut your mouth and take me back to my car. Okay, but… The random teleports to your apartment were one thing. But I was in a moving car. Audra could… They're suddenly cut off by the bass riff of a scene transition. Later in the episode, in what's supposed to be the double date scene at a fancy restaurant, George is not present in the booth with Jerry and her dates. Instead, he can be heard sobbing deeply into a payphone from the restroom corridor. Episode Number Title Summary 10-11 Total Eclipse Elaine and Moon Man have a falling out over whether or not the coming solar eclipse will have supernatural ramifications. George only appears in a single scene in Jerry's apartment. George is wearing a tuxedo. He accuses Jerry of teleporting him out of Audra's funeral and physically assaults him. 10-22 Best Divorce 2 A holiday special. George's father introduces the gritty reboot of Bestivus known as Bestivus 2. This episode marks the beginning of a 54-episode period in which George is present for all of his scenes, 
but refuses to speak. 10-76 Jerry the Janissary Having decided that he doesn't want children, Jerry tries to get a low-cost vasectomy from a mob doctor. George speaks again in another monk's cafe scene, but only to say, Hey Jerry, watch this. He proceeds to pour his hot coffee into the lap of a man in the next booth. The man does not react or even acknowledge his injury. Jerry demands that George never do this again. George smiles. In Episode 10-77, Operation Soup Valkyrie, this exchange occurs. George and Jerry are standing in a long line outside Soup Nazi's restaurant. I heard something about the order routine being changed up. Whenever I'm with you, nobody reacts to anything I do. I heard something about the ordering routine being, so, no one can hold me accountable. Do what you're meant to do, and they'll react, I promise! And you still haven't explained that. I physically cannot. Just pretend nothing weird is going on. Act like you used to. Like, get into soup mode. As George looks away, Jerry glances worriedly to the sky and mouths, I'm sorry, Mr. Gok. I don't know why he keeps doing this. George pulls out a pistol from his jacket and cuts the line. No! Fuck it. Making the most of it. He enters the restaurant and goes behind the counter. Laughing wildly, he shoots Soup Nazi seven times at point blank. Neither Soup Nazi nor the customers acknowledges. No pulse for you. Soup Nazi lies dead. George messily devours a fistful of broccoli cheddar soup straight from the pot. The only sounds heard are an incorrectly timed laugh track, and Jerry screams of horror. Episodes 10-77 through 10-173 follow a similar pattern. An ordinary episode is interrupted by George going on a crime spree that only Jerry notices. Every recurring character that George murders inexplicably comes back to life in another episode. For example, Soup Nazi returns in 10-124 titled, Soup is Risen. By the end of episode 10-173, George has murdered every other named character but Jerry at least once. Episode 10-174, The Keystone, ends prematurely in the following scene. Jerry emerges from his bedroom. Kramer sits on the floor outside. Jerry. What are you doing here? Kramer. I took up lockpicking. I mean, on the floor. Just thought I'd try it with your door. I think I won. Okay, but why are you on the… George's hand suddenly emerges from the bedroom door. He pulls Jerry back in and slams it shut behind him. Kramer continues acting off on an invisible Jerry. The following conversation is heard muffled behind the bedroom door. George. Why is Newman alive? George. Listen to me. I lit him on fire. We both saw him burn to ashes. Why is he alive? Why did you even have to kill him in the first place? It's the only source of serotonin I have left. Now answer my question. This isn't what Audra would have… A gunshot. Jerry screams. You don't get to say her name. You're the reason she's dead. Fuck's sakes, Jerry. I was just about to turn my life around. Why didn't she come back, huh? She wasn't relevant to the story. Is that why you killed her? I didn't kill her. Then who did? No one. You didn't teleport out of that car. It's not a teleport. It's just… look. It's like a starting point. Like the ghost square on Monopoly. Whenever something interesting happens, you naturally show up. I really wish I could explain it more than that, but… look. What do you know about Totlysoft? I'm going to give you five more seconds to say something that makes any sense at all. No, 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 you don't want this. I'm the one guy you can't kill. My last name is the title of the… Zero. Another gunshot. Kramer suddenly melts into a puddle of viscous black sludge. Cut to black. From this point on, the title of the show changes to Costanza. George is the only character who hasn't dissolved into oil. Unlike previous episodes, the laugh tracks have completely synchronized with George's actions. Episode Number Title Summary 10-175 
the Omeg George. George silently wanders the empty streets of New York City, searching for survivors. 10-180 Table for one. George spends the entirety of the episode quietly weeping in a booth of the dilapidated Monk's Cafe. 10-195 Bye, George. The episode lasts 12 seconds. It abruptly ends when George shoots himself. 10-196 Hi, George. George reappears in Jerry's apartment, alive and well. After a brief nervous breakdown, he jumps out the window to attempt suicide again. 10-197 Hi again, George. Similar content to 10-196, but he attempts to shoot himself while falling. 10-254 The Long and Winding Road He begins a 104-episode story arc of making a journey on foot to other cities to find survivors of the 10-174 event. He is unsuccessful. 10-358 Tamandus of King George Having given up his journey, he enters the ruins of Holy Name Cathedral in downtown Chicago. George kneels at the altar. He makes the sign of the cross. Okay, God? I think I get the point. This is my eternal damnation, isn't it? Or at least some kind of purgatory? That's the only thing that makes sense. I'll be the first to admit that I've been a selfish sack of shit all my life. I probably deserve worse. But that's why I tried to leave Jerry and the others in the first place. Did I start too late? But I'm not waking up at Jerry's place anymore. Which means there's a way that all this can change. I realize you probably got a whole mess of god shit to take care of right now. I probably backed up the line to the pearly gates around several blocks, right? Yeah. Too soon. Sorry. So I better cut to the chase. Can I have a sign? Something to indicate? An angelic chorus suddenly swells up. A soft white light pokes through the ruined ceiling, landing on George's face. Laugh track. George's eyes widen. This is the first time he's able to hear the sound. Is that a fucking laugh track? Episode 10-359 titled, George's Quest to Get Off the Airs, Part 1, begins with George stripping naked and writing, Am I Inappropriate Yet?, on the wall of the cathedral with his own beces. Amid repeated cries of censor me, stop watching this, and let me die, he captures, tortures, and mutilates several opossums. At the time of the testing moratorium, the last recorded iteration was George's Quest to Get Off of the Airs, Part 126.